straight ahead on Law & Crime Daily. NFL player Richard Sherman is released from jail without bail. The new video is showing him allegedly trying to force his way in to his in-laws' home. After 18 years, convicted wife killer Scott Peterson will get a new day in court to see if he deserves a new trial. The allegations of juror misconduct. He has the right to 12 independent jurors. Why did Robert Durst want to change his will right before his trial started? The millions the real estate heir now wants to leave to witnesses called to testify against him. Plus, is Mark Redwine guilty of the murder of his 13-year-old son? Jury verdict count number one, murder in the second degree. We the jury. Law and Crime Daily covering court cases from coast to coast. Welcome everyone to Law and Crime Daily. I'm Brian Buckmeyer along with Terry Austin. Pro footballer Richard Sherman is out of jail. He's due back in court for misdemeanor charges as new surveillance footage shows him trying to force his way into his in-laws home. In surveillance video released by the Redmond Police Department, former Seattle Seahawks player Richard Sherman is seen trying to open the front door to his in-laws' home. Sherman was arrested early Wednesday in Kings County. His wife called 911, saying her husband was drunk and belligerent and threatened suicide. I don't know where he's about. No, he's going through a really bad depression. He's on antidepressants and drank. He was threatening to kill himself. Sherman was due in court on Thursday, but his attorneys waived his first appearance. He's facing five misdemeanor charges, criminal trespass, malicious mischief, resisting arrest, and driving under the influence. He was originally booked on a felony charge of burglary, domestic violence, but that was dropped. Prosecutors requested Sherman's bail to be set at $10,000. The judge said Sherman is a pillar in the community, a business owner, husband, and father. Sherman was released without bail on a promise to return to court. Joining us today is civil rights attorney Katie Smith and Terry Austin. Katie, I've heard of people trying to break out of their in-laws, but never in. Any guess why the burglary, the only felony charge, was dropped? You're right, Brian. I believe it's because usually with a the burglary, there needs to be some sort of intent that you try to go in to commit a crime, particularly theft. And here, especially since he kept saying, come out, I don't know that he necessarily was trying to go in or there wasn't evidence that he was trying to go in to take anything. So I think that's why they rather prudently got rid of the charge that would likely not stick. Makes sense. Now, Terry Sherman's wife is standing behind him, giving a glimpse of what may be happening behind the scene. What do we know so far that may be able to help his case? You know, I think there are a number of factors, Brian, that could possibly help his case. First of all, no one was injured, and that's important. And I haven't seen any record of any prior arrest, so if that's the case, that's going to play a factor as well. And one of the other big issues is he has started this Richard Sherman Family Foundation, and he gives back to the community for children in low-income areas for educational purposes. So I actually think that's going to help as well. And his wife, as you said, is supporting him. They have two young children. I think all in all, if all of this is based on recent mental illness, I think all of that is going to play into what charges may eventually be dropped and what charges might be kept. Yeah. In many cases like this, a person who is an emotionally distressed person, as they may designate them an EDP, may not go to criminal court, but may go to a mental health court where services or aid is given to a person, especially for low-level charges such as this. We'll keep you updated on the Richard Sherman case as it progresses. Thank you both. Turning now to other top legal news making headlines, a jury found the Capitol Gazette shooter criminally responsible, rejecting the insanity defense for the mass killing. Jared Ramos pled guilty to 23 charges stemming from the June 28, 2018 shooting that left five people dead inside the newspaper's building. Investigators believe Ramos was out for revenge and spent years planning the attack. Defense attorneys claim Ramos was insane for years before the attack and remains so to this day. But the jury unanimously rejected that claim. Prosecutors are asking for him to receive five life sentences. And in California, prosecutors are continuing to present their case against Robert Durst and have a jailhouse phone call of the real estate heir wanting to leave millions to witnesses called to testify against him. Just months before the start of his trial last year, Durst has heard in a phone call to his second wife saying that if she dies before him, he would want his money split between several of his friends. 
Prosecutors have called those witnesses to the stand asking about allegations he murdered his best friend, Susan Berman. Durst cut ties with his family and the New York real estate company, the Durst Organization, in a $65 million deal in 2006. In this 2021 call, Durst says he would like $5 million to go to his friend, Susan Giordano. Prosecutors say Durst has given her $350,000 and promised to make sure she's set for life. Ma'am, is it your testimony that the first time that you ever heard Mr. Durst's intentions to leave you $5 million as a contingent beneficiary was playing this call today? You never heard that before? You never were aware of that information? No. You and Mr. Durst never had any discussion? No. Let's bring back civil rights attorney Katie Smith and co-host Terry Austin to discuss Durst's will. Terry, I've heard of money can't buy happiness, but it seems to be able to buy loyalty. How well is Lewin proving that point in the trial? Oh, no question Lewin is proving that point because apparently money can buy you loyalty. His friends are all people who will say and do anything for him. And Susan Giordano, if she already received several hundred thousand dollars and she's going to get five million, she will be set for life. And we know already that the testimony of other witnesses, Gene Clark, we have Emily and Stuart Altman, we have Douglas Oliver. All of these individuals have come on the stand. Lewin has spent hours with each of them showing exactly how loyal they are and what they expect to get back in return from Durst. So apparently money can buy you loyalty. I mean, Katie, there's so many signs of this kind of loyalty happening between the little waves or the fist bumps and these uh, witnesses it seem to be, the money they seem to be getting, sorry. Is there any doubt this is hush money for at least something? Oh, Brian, it just looks terrible, right? And that is being made evidently clear. You know, to this idea about money can't buy you happiness, I was talking to someone the other day and they said, well, those people have never been bailed out. Remember, no matter how much it is, usually money is worth less than their freedom. And it's obvious that he's willing to pay whatever he needs to to try to get off. All right. As the testimony continues there in the Robert Durst case, make sure to check it out on Law & Crime as we give you gavel to gavel coverage. Thank you both. Still ahead on Law & Crime Daily, a verdict in the trial of a Colorado man charged with murdering his 13-year-old son. First, Scott Peterson to get his day in court again. The wife killer now getting a hearing to see if he'll get a new trial. Everything you need to know next. Welcome back, Scott Peterson. The man convicted of killing his wife and unborn son will be getting a hearing on a claim of juror misconduct. Law and Crimes' Angela Levy is here to tell us what the judge is saying about her decision to hold a hearing. Brian Scott Peterson has been arguing for some time that a woman lied to get on to the jury and that he deserves a new trial because of it. Lacey Peterson was eight months pregnant when she vanished on Christmas Eve in 2002. Scott Peterson has maintained he didn't kill his wife and unborn son, but a jury found him guilty. Peterson's attorneys have called one juror, Rochelle Neese, a stealth juror. They say she lied about being a part of a lawsuit by not disclosing she sought a restraining order against her boyfriend's ex and to being a victim of domestic violence while she was pregnant in 2001. In court documents, Niece, who was nicknamed Strawberry Shortcake during the trial, stated she did not think the restraining order was a lawsuit and did not call police or consider herself a victim in the 2001 incident with her boyfriend. We feel like there are a number of things that, uh, when you look at the totality of everything that happened, it demonstrates that this one juror, in fact, was prejudiced coming into the jury deliberations, that she did, in fact, lie about to get on the jury. Judge Ann Christine Mazzullo wrote in an order, the facts in the case are in dispute and will require an evidentiary hearing. Judge Mazzullo also ordered prosecutors to formally admit or deny Peterson's claims about Nice. 
Peterson juror Mike Balmessieri said Nice had a strong opinion about the case when she was brought in as an alternate juror, but doesn't believe she tainted deliberations. Being a woman and a mother, why would that opinion not be a strong opinion? She didn't in any way uh, influence anyone. And uh, with her, with her, with her, her, her position. Meanwhile, Peterson's team feels good about the chances of getting a new trial. We feel very strongly that inevitably the truth is going to come out on this case. I spoke with Rochelle Neese's lawyer. Jeff Carr told me that the district attorney will be issuing a subpoena to have Rochelle Neese testify at that hearing. A date for that hearing will be set at um, another hearing later in August. Brian? Thanks, Angela. Back with us is civil rights attorney Katie Smith and Terry Austin. Terry, what is it that the defense has to prove to show jury misconduct? It's not easy, Brian. There are a number of forms of jury misconduct. Obviously, if you bring in outside evidence or if you go to the scene or if you communicate about the case, but this dishonesty about a fact during voir dire is what they are claiming here in this case. And in order to prove that, they are going to have to ask the juror about her understanding, about her prior experience. And the judge is going to want to determine whether or not the jury was actually tainted during the deliberation. So it would have to have an effect on the ultimate outcome of the case. And frankly, it's a very serious issue, and she could be held in contempt of court. All right, so that's the game plan there, Katie. But do you see a winning argument for the prosecution that there was no jury misconduct? I think it really goes down to this evidentiary hearing because obviously the prosecution and the witness are saying that this was just a mistake of fact. Not every misrepresentation is intentional or rises to the level of misconduct. It would have to have been, number one, some level of intent, um, for example, disobedience to instructions, inappropriate communications, things that have more of an intentional, intentional nature. And then secondarily, it actually to actually affect the proceeding. If she was fair from then on out, it really doesn't have that much of an effect. So they have some hurdles to get over. Absolutely. And of course, weighing the evidence itself uh, in the trial to see whether or not this is what many would call harmless error or, in fact, an error that needs a new trial. And Jeanette, has the judge requested more information from the defense attorneys? Actually, she has. She requested uh, two copies of basically the case file, the trial transcripts, the exhibits, everything. She wants one for her chambers in San Francisco and then another copy to keep at the San Mateo County Courthouse where all of these proceedings are being held. She was brought in to preside over this case especially. And she wants an electronic copy of all of those items too. So she is looking to really dig into this case and get to the bottom of all of the facts and what went on. It looks like that's just the plan here. The judge wanting more information from the defense, a hearing about to be put on. Of course, we'll get to the bottom of this in the California versus Scott Peterson case. Thank you everyone for contributing. We'll continue to keep eyes on this case as it develops. Coming up on Law and Crime Daily, what a bunch of retired law enforcement officers are doing on social media. Plus, the 13-year-old missing after a trip to Colorado. His father on trial for murder. Will a jury believe Mark Redwine killed his son? Or did Dylan disappear on his own? Our legal analysis ahead. Welcome back. Mike the Cop is a police officer turned social media influencer, and he's sharing a glass with our own Sean Sticks Larkin on both of their returns to civilian life in the latest episode of the podcast, Cop Tales. I'm kind of scared that you're in here. That you're, that you're in. No, all, all seriousness, listen, man, for anybody that's, uh, you know, law enforcement, man, I'm all behind it, man. I don't care if people are ideas for TV shows, doing books, uh, a scripted yeah. show, you know, podcasts, whatever it is, man. Get There's out. room for everybody, man. Just, uh, it's awesome to see cops, former cops, all that stuff. It's a different world than I think I started writing a blog back in like 2014 and felt like an Island. And now there's so, so much of a law enforcement presence on social media. It's really cool, man. Yeah, it is. So, uh, Let's cheers to you, first of all, man. Absolutely. Thanks for being on here. Cheers to you, you know, take, cheers. Uh, walking away from the profession as well, or retiring, as I guess we call it. Three men were arrested in Texas for a kidnapping and murder of a man in 2016. But 
As Jesse Weber, the host of the TV series Prime Crime, tells us, don't believe everything you hear. Hey there, Brian. Yeah, this story is unique. We have a reported home invasion with a young mother named Samantha Wolford explaining how she and her husband were attacked. In fact, the assailants kidnapped her husband. Now, it becomes a race to find him, and through Samantha's account, we get clues as to what happened. And as far as you yourself, you didn't have any involvement in this whatsoever? No. You, didn't, you and Ernie didn't get into a fight? No. Things didn't get out of hand? You didn't, no. You didn't shoot him? You didn't stab him? You didn't hit him with a bat? No. I but as we carefully review her interrogation and the responding officer's body cam footage, where this case leads is absolutely shocking. Tune in to Law & Crime. For more, make sure to check out Jesse Weber on Prime Crime. Thank you, Jesse. When we come back, the deliberations keep us all on the edge of our seats. After weeks of a trial, which side will the jury believe in Colorado versus Mark Redwine? The verdict, next. Jury verdict count number one. Murder in the second degree. We, the jury, find the defendant, Mark Redwine, guilty of count number one. Murder in the second degree. Jury verdict, count number two, child abuse. We, the jury, find the defendant, Mark Redwine, guilty of count two, child abuse. After about six hours of deliberation, a Colorado jury found Mark Redwine guilty in the murder of his 13-year-old son. Redwine is accused of killing his son, Dylan Redwine. Prosecutors say the boy confronted Redwine after seeing photos of his father dressed in woman's lingerie and eating feces. Dylan vanished on Thanksgiving weekend in 2012 while on a court-mandated trip to his father's. But Redwine maintains his innocence, claiming that wild animals could have killed the boy after he ran away. The prosecutors at the La Plata County Sheriff's Department Federal Bureau of Investigation, Colorado Bureau of Investigation, National Forest Service cannot tell you after nine years what happened because they don't know. If they don't know, you don't know. You may not like the pictures of Mr. Redwine, and you may not approve of the way he handled himself during the search for his son, and you may not approve the way he handled himself during the divorce. You may not approve a lot of things he does, but if they don't know what happened, you don't know what happened. If you don't know what happened, regardless of your opinions of the defendant and how he comported himself while his son was missing and dead, you must return verdict of not guilty. In the rebuttal, prosecutors say Mark Redwine's action prove he is guilty of the second-degree murder of his son. Mark Redwine was the last person seen with Dylan. Mark Redwine was the last person with Dylan when he was heard from by anybody in the universe. He had the opportunity and the reason to hurt Dylan, whether it's the poop pictures, whether it's a fight they're having, an argument. He took his head, Dylan's head, with enough force to kill him and made cuts into his bones. He killed Dylan. You'll tell your loved one. He's also guilty because he had Dylan's blood in his house. And there was DNA down there. And he had the smell of a human body, a human remains dog alerted on multiple spots in the same room where they were sitting, that same room that I just talked about where there was blood found, where there was tension and anger, and they were roughhousing. the smell of human remains in his truck. Katie, the jury wanted the transcripts of Agent Gersing, but when they couldn't get it, they came back with a verdict. Does that tell you anything? Yeah, Brian, you know, I see this a lot, especially in federal court, where the jury wants maybe a quick look at some of the testimony, but then they realize it's a lot bigger deal because the testimony needs to be located and read back. And a lot of times that's to resolve some minor factual discrepancy amongst the jurors. What I understand here is that they had already had their minds decided. They didn't want to wait the whole weekend and come back on Monday, so they were ready to call in the verdict, which they did. Absolutely, they called it in as well. 
um, pretty quickly after about six hours of deliberating. Uh, Terry, was this the verdict you were expecting? And if so, why do you think it took six hours? You know, I did expect a guilty verdict. I thought that the prosecution put on an excellent case. They showed, in fact, that there was blood DNA. They knew that he was with Mark before he passed, and it was the last person he was with. They showed the cuts on the skull. They showed that Molly, the dog, indicated. They showed his cavalier attitude. So for all those reasons, I was expecting a guilty verdict, but I was a little bit concerned, Brian, because there could have been some doubt. As you heard the defense closing there, he was saying no one really knows what happened, and it was all circumstantial. So there could have been one juror who held out, and of course, you could get a mistrial based on that, and you wouldn't get a guilty verdict because a guilty verdict obviously has to be unanimous. So I was a little worried, but I think it took six hours because they considered all of the evidence and they came back with a right result. Now, Terry, appeals. You know the defense is going to make an appeal for any number of issues. Do you see any issues that the defense may be successful upon appeal? You know, I think the judge ran an excellent court. I don't think he let any evidence in that should not have gotten in, and I don't think he left anything out. So I think they're not going to have any judicial error. And I didn't see any evidence of, you know, jury misconduct either. So I think that on appeal, we're going to have solid grounds. I think, obviously, the defense is going to have to try to appeal because that's the right of the defendant. But I didn't see anything that stood out to me here, Brian. All right. Thank you, Terry. And Katie, sentencing for Mark Redwine is sometime in October, where he faces up to 48 years for the top count of murder in the second degree, also guilty of child abuse. Thank you both. And thank you for joining us here on Law & Crime Daily. We'll see you next time as we discuss justice in America.